Just three miles from the child's home where she vanished. Did they get a tip? Did they find anything? Uh, we're going to tell you what cops told us. Plus, we've got the chilling 911 calls made by Isabel's mom and dad the very morning Isabel was discovered missing. There is a startling difference between the two, mom and dad. You'll hear for yourself next. Tonight, secrets and shockers revealed as we hear for the first time the 911 calls of little Isabel Celis' parents reporting her missing. The six-year-old's mother hysterical, but the dad eerily calm, even chuckling. Why did cops release these tapes now, just days after the dad was banned from seeing his sons? Are investigators on the verge of cracking this case? We'll analyze the tapes, the discrepancies we've uncovered, and we'll take your call. Plus, we're shedding and shredding. We've released recordings of the 911 calls on the disappearance of six-year-old Isabel Sellis. Hello? Hello, ma'am. Are you the mom? Yes. Okay, what is your name? My name is Rebecca Sellis. C-E-L-I-S. Who noticed her gone? Your husband? My husband. I went to work this morning at 7 and... You didn't hear brown anything hair. at all? No. I didn't hear anything at all. We are cooperating to the fullest extent. We're labeling it as suspicious circumstances and a possible abduction. Her parents say she was snatched from her bedroom last month while Isabel's father seemed to be somewhat calm. Why do you think she was abducted? I have no idea. We woke up this morning. I went to go get her up for her baseball game, and she's gone. Is mom there also? And she had just left for work. I just called her, and I told her to get her butt home. <laughs> Tonight, the raw and emotional 9-11 takes from the morning that six-year-old Tucson girl Isabel Sellis was discovered missing from her bedroom. You will hear both of her parents talking to 911 operators. One frantic, the other parent eerily calm as they describe the chaos at their home. And we've also got inside information that there are numerous inconsistencies in the father's statement of police. Cops released the 911 tapes on the heels of another huge announcement that Isabel's parents are no longer living together and that their father is not allowed to have any contact whatsoever with his two sons, Isabel's two brothers, boys ages 10 and 14. That news clearly put in the spotlight on the father. So why release these 911 calls now? Our cops try to put pressure on Isabel's father. Listen to Isabel's mom, who is clearly distraught. Now you look everywhere under the bed, the closet is breaking. We're almost there, ma'am, okay? Where, where is your husband and your kids? Okay. Heartbreaking, but that's what you would expect when a mother finds this precious child missing. But now let's listen to Isabel's father, who seems to be handling the disappearance of his daughter with utter calm. Is mom there also? And she had just left for work. I just called her and I told her to get her butt home. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, did you hear that correctly? Was that a chuckle from the dad? Listen carefully to that again. Is mom there also? And she had just left for work. I just called her and I told her to get her butt home. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Isabel was last seen April 20th when her dad says... He put her to bed, but she was gone the next morning. He tells the 911 operator her window was open, the screen on the ground outside. That was nearly four weeks ago. Uh, today, investigators searched again, this time a wash like this one, in the desert near uh, an Air Force base in the area, only three miles from Isabel's home. Cops have talked to hundreds of sex offenders. Dogs hit on something in Isabel's room, we understand. Uh, but no arrest yet. Could these 911 tapes unlock the secrets to this very disturbing mystery. Call me, 1-877-JVM-SAYS. I want to hear your theories, 1-877-586-7297. Straight out to reporter Kevin Keene on the ground with KGUN in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Kevin, what can you tell us about the searches by authorities today? The very latest is that the authorities, up to 30 of them, have spent the day searching this wash, this desert-like area south 
on the south side of Tucson looking for, well, we don't know exactly what they were looking for. We know that they brought sheriff's deputies with them, officers, as well as a canine unit. They say that they came here based um, on some information and wanted to conduct a, a search, a, a repeat search. They have searched this area before. They haven't been able to say how many times they've searched this. They didn't get any give any specifics about what that information was, what exactly they were looking for, just that this is a routine part of when a child goes missing. They are not, they're willing to revisit areas, to research places, and that's what happened today. It's interesting, though. This is happening on the very day that the world is hearing these 911 calls. Is this part of a strategy? Listen to Isabel's father on this 911 call. Does he sound unusually, even eerily calm and reserved to you? Okay, Tom, Hello, I need to report a uh, missing child. I believe she was abducted from my house. Okay, how old? Six years old. Okay, is it your daughter? Yes. Why do you think she was abducted? I have no idea. We woke up this morning. I went to go get her up for her baseball game, and she's gone. Now, contrast that with his over-the-top emotions at the press conference. Now, some even said at the time they thought he was a little, a tad theatrical. Watch it. We're looking for you, Isa. We love you, and we miss you so much, and we will never give up. Stacy Kaiser, psychotherapist. The contrast between this man at the news conference when the world is watching and his flatline lack of emotion when he's calling 911 to report his daughter abducted is startling. I agree with you 100%, but let me explain something to you. Oftentimes, people who sound calm in emergency situations are really trying to be controlled. And one of the things we hear is a little laughter that's going on. And oftentimes, that's a psychological response to anxiety. And it's literally the person's desire to try and convince themselves that the situation isn't as serious as they originally thought it was. Well, other possibilities. John Lieberman, investigative reporter, you've been studying these tapes. What do you make of them? Well, first of all, let me give it to you straight. Cops are frustrated here, and they released the 911 tapes because now they've completed multiple interviews with family members, including my sources are saying they found various inconsistencies in the father's multiple statements, and they didn't want the family to hear what was on this 911 tape prior to cops being able to interview all of them multiple times. Now they've released it, now it's out there, and frankly, they want to put pressure on this father, on this family, whoever else might have information uh, to speak up, and they're tired of playing games, and that is why you saw the release today. Uh, listen to this from the 911 call placed by Isabel's father. He doesn't even seem to understand what the operator is asking at times. All right, well, um, we've got so many different clips from the father and the mother that we're going to play to you, but I want to go to Mark Iglorsch right now and just get your bottom line reaction to this dad being so eerily calm. Well, first of all, thank goodness for Stacey Kaiser. Until I heard what she just said, there was no other conclusion in my mind other than guilt as much as I'm trying not to judge this man. I listened to the 911 tape several times. When I heard him chuckle, when I heard the tone that he used, which sounded like he was ordering a pizza, it's the same tone. I'd like to uh, you know, let you know that my child is missing. I'm going to need a large with two toppings. It's the same tone. I'm trying not to judge. But thanks to Stacy, I now see, okay, some people can react that way and would react differently than I would if my precious offspring were taken from my castle. Now, listen to this. Add to that what the cops said on the, uh, what he said on the call to the cops. Cops have said this before, but the 911 calls confirm that it was indeed the father, Sergio Celis, who discovered his daughter missing. Nobody else. Listen to him describe those initial minutes when he couldn't find Isabel. I woke up my, my sons, I, we looked everywhere in the house, and my oldest son noticed that her window was wide open and the screen was laying in the backyard. We've looked all around the house. My sons are, okay, running, yeah, my sons are running around the house looking for her. The screen was on the ground outside? Yes. All right, Steve Moore, former FBI. This confirms that he's the one, and then he told his son. So it wasn't like he and the sons walked into the room simultaneously. It's all on Dad's word. 
Right. And I'm not so much concerned about his affect during the 911 calls as I am about the fact that he just jumped to the conclusion, apparently, that there was an abduction. She couldn't have fallen out the window. She couldn't have tried to escape without uh, alerting them. He seems to have the answers that he wants the police to have. That's what concerns me, that he went immediately to she was abducted. It's conclusive. A lot of times people tell the police what they want the police to believe. Yeah, I found that startling, that it's almost the first thing out of his mouth. Who uses the word abduction? You know, you, you first you check the neighborhood to make sure that you didn't get confused and that somebody didn't take the child accidentally, a babysitter, a relative. John Lieberman. Well, he hit the nail on the head, yeah. It's as much about what he said in that call as it was about his intonation. Kevin Keene, you're out there. What's the reaction to these tapes? There's been a lot of talk from people who are just watching the tapes, listening to the tapes, watching the story, following the story very closely. But I will tell you, yesterday, the, when the police um, released those 911 tapes, the chief gave that press conference himself, and he wanted to make clear, you can make what you will of it, that at this point, no one has been ruled a suspect. Everyone is a potential suspect, and the police are focusing on external um, people outside of the family, a possibility of a stranger abducting or taking little Isabel. Also, detectives are still looking inside the family to other family members as well. But the, the chief stressed that there wasn't just one person that they're taking a look at. And 911 tapes, certainly he didn't talk much about, but um, that adds to the, the speculation. On the other side, more tapes. The mother. Just, I didn't even come and check on her. I said, I'm going to check on her. Okay. All right, just take a deep breath, okay? She doesn't have any medical conditions? No, she has nothing. I'm sorry, she has what? She has nothing. There's no medical conditions. She's healthy. No allergies, no medical conditions. Okay, you didn't hear brown anything hair. at all? No, I didn't hear anything at all. All right, there is the mother of little Isabel, appropriately, I would say, hysterical. Let's listen to the dad again as he makes a joke while talking to the 911 operator. Is mom there also? Yeah, she had just left work. I just called her and I told her to get her butt home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Celine Darkelstani, an HLN senior producer, we had a meeting this morning and... Again, we want to stress that there are no suspects, and this man is not considered a suspect, but clearly the focus has become uh, squarely centered on him because of what you might call his sort of odd reaction on the 911 calls. And we were talking about it. We were, we were trying to basically say, well, what's the innocent explanation for um, actually making a joke when you are calling police to report your daughter abducted? Celine. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, Jane. I'm not an attorney. I'm just a regular person hearing that. That's all everybody can focus on. And then I will one call is the father because that is, that is not a normal reaction. That is just not a normal reaction to your kid being missing. And this is the same father who we've seen in the press conferences, hysterical, crying, being, as you said, theatrical. And he's the same guy on these calls now very calm so there is he, it's not the same person something isn't clicking it's not it doesn't add up this is not the same guy we saw in the press conferences yeah and let's listen again to isabel's dad immediately using the word abducted when he speaks to the 911 operators almost the first thing out of his mouth listen police department hello i need to report a uh, missing child i believe she was abducted from my house Okay, how old? Six years old. Okay, is it your daughter? Yes. Why do you think she was abducted? I have no idea. We woke up this morning. I went to go get her up for her baseball game, and she's gone. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary to use the word abducted in the first five seconds or ten seconds of a call to 911 when you can't find your little girl in the morning. Although, you know, with all the abductions that we covered and all the media covers around the country, maybe that is the reaction that parents have these days. Um, let's go to Greg, Connecticut. Your question or thought, Greg? Hey, Jane. Thank you for taking my call. I've been a fan of yours since you were an anchor here in New York back in the day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I just wanted to say that it's, um, I don't have kids, but in this day and age of media technology, 
it's hard to know how you're going to react. And when you're going to be in the spotlight like this, you have the media. You don't win if you go out there, and you don't win if you keep quiet because everyone's going to form a judgment. And you just don't know how you would react to a child missing. And when you have to play for the camera and everybody or majority of people may think you're guilty, it just adds this element that I don't think that the Tateses or the Walshes had back in their day when their children were taken. So it just it seems to be a lose-lose situation, although it, it does sound eerily calm, especially on the... Uh, my son's baseball game, mm -hmm. you know, about 10.30 last night. <clears throat> Everyone took their showers and they all went to bed. I even was in the living room watching uh, the Diamondbacks game at midnight and I fell asleep and I never heard anything weird. So I was like just on the other side of the wall from her. Now contrast that uh, with what Isabel's neighbor said about what she heard at 6 a.m. on the morning the child was discovered missing. Room. My dog, she woke me up. She's very skeptical of people and when she heard voices she started barking and that woke me up and that's when I noticed the uh, male voices multiple male voices and I noticed that the Celis's dogs were going crazy and they bark a lot but this was a different type of barking this was a very very frantic barking all right John Lieberman investigative reporter she heard male voices and dogs going crazy the dad didn't hear that and then what about him watching this game we actually checked and uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks play the Atlanta Braves that night Game time, 6.40 p.m. Arizona time. The game lasted three hours, so it was over by 9.30. Right. Well, he could have DVR'd it. Yeah, he could have DVR'd it, but it's almost like he's setting up an alibi. Obviously, he hasn't been charged, and he's not, a, he's not named a suspect, but it's almost like he's volunteering this information that isn't even appropriate to volunteer at that time, that he was on the couch, it was midnight. It's like he's setting up an alibi for not being in bed with his wife at midnight so she might not think anything was wrong. But there are other inconsistencies, too. He gave a flawed description of the girl on the 911 tape. You know, he says she's in blue shorts and a pink top. Well, the mother says, no, that's not true. He says he put her to bed at 1030 at night. We have found other inconsistencies there, too, with the time. So it's the cumulative effect of all of the inconsistencies here. Now, when Isabel's dad called cops, did the 911 operator already suspect something was off? Listen to this exchange. And you're both natural parents of the child? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so no, no step parents, any problems with any grandparents? No. Okay. Do you not have any family issues, anything like that? No. Okay, so Mark Iglars, criminal defense attorney, the operator is asking that question because statistically most abductees are taken by someone they know. Three out of four children are either related or acquainted with their kidnapper. Yeah, th th there's a lot of questions being asked during this conversation. And again, I need to try not to judge this guy because maybe he's completely innocent and, and it would be horrible for us to say something negative. However, this 911 operator is asking him every question and not one time does he say, send someone. Are you sending someone? Please send mm. someone now. Nothing, not even in a calm voice. I'll give him that. Let's say he just talks very calm. Um, are you going to be sending someone? She asks him uh, the names of the, the two sons. What are their ages? At some point, I'm like, ma'am, could we do this later? Could you send someone? I'm trying not to judge him. But that was absent, too, from the call. Yeah, and I also noticed, Celine, that when he did hold that emotional news conference, he said, we're going to search you forever. It was a tad early, in my opinion, to announce that you're going to search for someone forever when you hope to find them right away. Celine, 10 seconds. Since the beginning, he's been doing that, and he's been saying, we're going to bring you back. Whoever has her, bring her back. How does he know who has her? If it's, if, if they're, if they're, is it, are they out for ransom? I mean, how does he know these things? Parents of six-year-old Isabel Sellis. Hello? Hello, ma'am. Are you the mom? Yes. Okay, what is your name? My name is Rebecca Sellis. C-E-L-I-S. Who noticed her gun? Your husband? My husband. I went to work this morning at 7, and... Did you have brown anything? hair at all? No, I didn't hear anything at all. We are cooperating to the fullest extent. We're labeling it as suspicious circumstances and a possible abduction. Her parents say 
She was snatched from her bedroom last month. Well, Isabel's father seemed to be somewhat calm. Why do you think she was abducted? I have no idea. We woke up this morning. I went to go get her up for her baseball game, and she's gone. Is mom there also? And she had just left work. I just called her, and I told her to get her back home. <laughs> Unbelievable 911 tapes. You are hearing them tonight. Isabel's mother and father calling 911, reporting her missing. Now, the dad is the one who says he discovered her missing and then alerts his two boys, ages 10 and 14. They go around and frantically try to find the child. The mother, who's a nurse, had left for work early in the morning without checking on the child, she says, and she was at the hospital races back. Now, uh, considering the circumstances, we've all been talking about Isabel's father being almost eerily calm and collected on the 911 call. Not so the mother. She is understandably frantic. My wife just got home and she's kind of hysterical and freaking out. Right, okay. Tell her we are on the way. We've got a bunch of officers on the way. I want you guys to stay there in the house. We will. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Stacey Kaiser, psychotherapist, we've been talking about how calm the father is, almost like, as somebody said, he's ordering a pizza, where the mother is screaming and crying, as you would expect. Um, is it possible that that is their relationship, that he's the cold, icy one and may feel that that's a gender role and uh, that he is doing that to try to stay strong for the children? It is absolutely possible. I think there's a good possibility that what he's trying to do is be calm, cool, and collected. He could also be in shock. But all of that said, there have been some other red flags here for me, some of them that you've brought up. But I do want to add this. I work with protect Child Protective Services a lot. They like to keep children with both of their parents. And so it is extraordinarily fishy to me that he is now not being with his two boys. All right, John Lieberman. In every case I've ever been involved in, to follow up on what Stacy was saying, Child Protective Services will only separate a parent from their children in cases of abuse, hypothetically. I have seen it, though, in cases they separate them for allegations of sexual abuse or allegations of physical abuse. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I'm saying generally, I mean, the father isn't even granted visitation rights right now with the kids. Yeah, but uh, Mark Iglars, there are those who say that that's because the police want to separate the father from the kids because those are the three individuals, the two boys and dad, who were there at the time she was discovered missing. And so they want to make sure they don't coordinate their stories. True, and I'm bending over backwards to try to support that theory and disagree with John and Stacy. but the reality is... I also, in 20 years, have never heard of a father being separated from his offspring um, unless there's something very significant. Um, even if you wanted to solve this potential uh, missing child um, scenario, you wouldn't say, okay, so you just can't see your kids for no reason. There has to have been a significant reason why they separated him from his children. Steve Moore, former FBI agent, is this an effort, all of this, the separating him from the kids, the release of the 911 tapes where I'm sure the police know the conclusions that some people will draw, namely that his behavior is odd at the very least. Is this part of a strategy on the part of cops? And if so, what is that strategy? Yes, it's a strategy or it's, it's incredibly irresponsible. Uh, I believe it's a strategy. Uh, I, I'm not saying that the separation of the kids has anything to do with putting pressure on him, but certainly that's the end result. The police, um, to me, have, uh, have an idea of what they're doing here. They're very intentional in what they're doing. This is not accidental. Neither was the search today. They say, well, it's just going back covering ground. Out of all the... Tucson, you covered this one area. No, they're getting more information that they're letting on. They've got the pieces to the puzzle, and we're just having to guess, but they've got more pieces than we uh, would even guess right now. And I'm sure more will be revealed in the coming days. We're all over the story. Final thought from Vivian, Florida. Vivian, Florida, your question or thought? I just want to know if, I mean, every time they make a um, statement, he always batting his eyes. Why he, he never made eye contact? He always looked down and his eyes just go batting his eyes. Closing, yeah, a, a lot eyes. of people, I'm, Vivian, good point. Stacy Kaiser, a lot of people made the point that during the news conference when he was crying, he was looking down a lot. Now, he could have been reading from a statement, but uh, uh, armchair psychologists say that's always a sign of something. 
Yeah, I mean, it could be a sign of, of shame. Sometimes from a body language perspective, he could be feeling ashamed, but he also could be uncomfortable. These kind of media experiences for somebody who's not used to being in front of all these cameras can be really uncomfortable. All right, we're all over.